education, especially in the context, uh, context of South Asia. Uh, so the last time we did, I did the same session last time. Uh, but when I was preparing for this session, I I found some excellent studies and some literature, especially in in uh, in regards to South Asia and liberal arts education. So I uh, actually tend to uh, talk about that in this particular presentation. Uh, Gohar, this is the presentation from the last year. I'm not sure if I shared the new one with you. Uh, uh, no, ma'am, I don't think so. So okay. moving on, um, my objective uh, for today would be in addition to the agendas that uh, Gohar has highlighted. Uh, I would like all of us to think uh, and take liberal arts education, uh, I mean, of course, as a philosophy, but also to see that, you know, what are the practical implications of liberal arts education when it comes to our uh, institutional, individual, uh, and then, uh, you know, country or societal level, uh, you know, understanding of liberal arts education. Uh, so I will first go through uh, liberal arts education, especially some of the terms that are associated with it. What does it mean, especially for our new faculty? Uh, and then slowly and gradually, uh, I think the most important part uh, of this presentation, and I, 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 I still have to learn uh, about the full context of uh, liberal arts education in South Asia, but there are emerging studies. Unfortunately, we don't have studies about liberal arts education in Pakistan, but there are very interesting studies in East Asia and Japan and uh, India and other parts of South Asia where we can learn from, you know, their experiences and then we can, you know, sort of re relate to their experiences as well. Uh, so talking about the liberal arts education, uh, to begin with, of course, I, I think the, the faculty would know some of these, but again, I would just reiterate uh, some of the important points. Uh, so liberal arts education actually talks about uh, not just being a professional, but being a citizen. So that is, I think, the core of liberal arts education because it trains and teaches and prepares uh, the students just not to be an expert in a certain field, uh, a specific field, but to have a, you know, a broader holistic experience to become better citizens, to become better a uh, person who are not just serving their own selves, but their families, their countries, and then, you know, be also uh, relevant to the to the global world and be a global citizen. Uh, so that is like the, the overall philosophy of liberal arts education. Uh, when we talk about liberal arts education, there are some terms that are uh, interrelated, but they still have a have a separate or a different meaning. So when we say that liberal arts education. So liberal arts education is the philosophy that we've just spoken about. Uh, liberal arts itself includes a range of disciplines and interdisciplinary, uh, you know, fields that are part of that liberal arts education. And uh, general education, of course, is a very, very critical and a very crucial component of liberal arts education. <clears throat> so when we say liberal arts education, and especially in our discussion with students, this is something that we uh, we do get as a very frequent question from them that, you know, uh, we are taking a variety of uh, subjects and then how do we know that, you know, where we are heading with it, why we are taking certain subjects. Uh, I think the liberal arts education, uh, our, our answer to them should be or would be that, you know, liberal arts education sort of provides you uh, a very breadth a very uh, again wide field of experiences of study but at the same time they do have that uh, you know orientation where they provide necessary uh, vocational training so liberal arts sometimes the major confusion in the students is that they are taking you know so many uh, subjects that sometimes they feel that they are lost and they don't don't really know where to go from there but i think uh, the spirit of the liberal arts is to st sort of strike a balance between the general education uh, providing a variety of field of study but at the same time providing necessary uh, vocational and expert and professional training for them to join their own respective fields uh, and then of course uh, one of the reasons that liberal arts has again grown to be a force is is that you know we are sort of you know traditionally uh, we had a very uh, restricted pedagogical, uh, you know, system and higher education used to be in a certain way. And over the period of time, we have sort of found out that we are, we need more skills, we need more, uh, you know, values to be included in the education. So hence liberal arts uh, education is trying to address all those problems that were existing in the past. Uh, then moving on to the central elements of liberal arts education. So as uh, I have discussed before that, you know, 
interdisciplinary approach is, is very core to liberal arts education, uh, where there's an amalgamation of arts and humanities and social sciences and natural sciences. Uh, this reminds me of a very interesting example that I've just read. And I think it's a very relevant example in the today's world. And uh, there was this example that, you know, if, if we if we look at uh, liberal arts education and global citizenship is a very important component. And most of the institutions do say that, you know, we have global citizenship as part of our mission or as part of our learning objectives, especially in the liberal arts universities. So again, uh, if you look at global global citizenship and if you look at the problem of crisis uh, communication, uh, sorry, climate communication or climate crisis, so if we take that as an example, so it really makes us think not just about one discipline, but multiple disciplines that are associated with one problem of climate crisis or climate, uh, you know, change. So let's say if, when we talk about climate crisis or climate uh, change, we are we are talking about the problems that is multifaceted and multifold. Uh, so for example, if the farmers have to leave their lands because of uh, the devastation of their crops and fields because of the climate change, so then they are moving to uh, cities. So those cities will again uh, need to assess the needs and infrastructure and do need, need to do the town planning and they will turn into mega cities. So when they will become the mega cities, so they of course have to employ uh, you know strategies in order to sort of cater to the new populations that are migrating. So again, those migrations, uh, the populations that have migrated will again be open to whole set of challenges. So there are going to be challenges of social conflicts, challenges of displacement, challenges of political instability, challenges of employment. So this just by looking at this one example that liberal arts education talks about global citizenship and one of the problems of global citizenship is to sort of address climate change. The climate change itself has, ha has a multifaceted, uh, you know, uh, you know, approaches to look at. So a, a person who is who has liberal arts education background or who has approach to the holistic curriculum will be able to understand that, you know, the problems are interconnected. This is a very interconnected world that we are living in. And I think the spirit and one of the core elements of liberal arts education is interdisciplinary approach. So again, the climate change or climate crisis will only be not be solved by the person who's expert in the climate studies, but also people with expertise in economics, expertise in psychology, because it talks about issues of displacement and issues of social exclusion. It, it also talks about the inclusion of expertise and some knowledge from the areas of conflict, communication. Uh, so again, this example was very interesting for us to sort of understand that, you know, it's it's no, we are not existing in isolation. So we have to look at uh, the realm that we are existing and it's very interdisciplinary in nature. Uh, moving on to the general education component. So general education, as, uh, as we did discuss a couple of minutes ago, is a component that helps us to be more holistic when we are moving in the world. So it's just not about get, gaining the professional expertise or becoming a profession. It, it also sort of helps you understand that where we are existing as a citizen in connection to uh, the immediate units that we are connected with, uh, whether it's your family, it's your community, it's your society, country, uh, or the world overall. Uh, then elemental skills, of course, all of this should contribute to some of the skills that are, of course, critical thinking, uh, problem solving, global citizenship we've just spoken about, and then social responsibility. So this is like a baseline understanding of liberal arts education and um, one of the most core elements of liberal arts education. Um, moving on uh, to liberal arts and Asia. Now, this has been uh, especially of my interest because, and this of uh, this understanding of specially understanding liberal arts education in Asia started with the workshop that I took, I think, back in 2017. It was a great workshop in terms of understanding that how we are doing and especially how Asia is doing in terms of liberal arts education. So in this workshop, it was organized by Harvard South Asian Institute. So there were representatives of uh, different South Asian institutes. And it was very fascinating to see that all of us are actually struggling somewhere in the similar uh, areas as far as uh, liberal arts education curriculum is concerned. Um, and then also uh, looking for liberal arts education institution and then, you know, uh, their existence, their acknowledgement, their acceptance their ownership so i think uh, uh, all of the south asian countries did have some kind of similarity when they were referring to these challenges uh, so talking about liberal arts education in south asia so south asia asia itself uh, contributes about 7 37% of the liberal arts initiatives outside us 
so there there are very interesting uh, initiatives uh, institutes universities especially in the private sector in these countries where uh, slowly and gradually they are moving towards making liberal arts universities and liberal arts education institutions uh, i would be interested in talking about uh, the challenges now the chal it was it was amazing to learn about the challenges that you know and especially in pakistan because in pakistan uh, only two universities three universities were at the at this workshop so uh, we were presenting from farman christian college and then habib university karachi because they also have a liberal arts program so they were there and then of course uh, lums also have com some component of liberal arts education uh, so they were uh, there as well in terms of you know sort of looking at uh, liberal arts education and their problems and then we had colleagues from uh, nepal and uh, bangladesh and in the india and other parts of asia as well so uh, talking about the challenges if you look at the challenges that are stated there are at the different levels so there are self challenges there are challenges that are again uh, for the institution to consider societal level challenges global context uh, challenges and then of course market challenges to begin with of course uh the first and the foremost challenge is about this the student staff and faculty so again uh, first of all there is i mean uh, because we started our discussion on on sort of understanding the terms and their differences and their confusion so i think that the same understanding or the same confusion also lies in the heads of faculty and parents and staff and students sometimes and there is a lot of knowledge gap when it comes to liberal arts education and liberal arts degrees when especially when it comes to local uh, you know education market like pakistan or india or bangladesh or you know other uh, asian countries as well uh, so that knowledge gap is related to liberal arts education because sometimes it's it, there is a lot of confusion and the confusion is that you are training you know for a number of you are taking a variety of subjects and you are you have different fields of study uh, but you don't feel that you are at par to an institution or to a graduate who has come from uh, you know a, a professional school uh, so that basically is the kind of you know uh, confusion or lack of understanding regarding liberal, liberal arts education uh, sometimes when faculty is also looking at their curriculum when they are designing their curriculum uh the same kind of knowledge gap could also be seen and skepticism could be seen when we are looking at our curriculum and when we are designing it and when we are sort of teaching it to our students so the first is that you know it big like there's a self doubt there is a confusion there's a skepticism about the liberal arts at this level so at the level of the students of course uh, because when they are not sure and especially those who teach freshman classes uh they would agree with me that you know a student who has come into a business program or a psychology program and they take uh, you know a science course or a math course it's very hard for them to to understand that why they are taking a certain course uh, so that's one so there is a lot of like skepticism and it really takes a lot of time for faculty advisors to sort of discuss with them and make them understand that you know what how we are we getting with this so it's just not uh, you know a subject the subject is of course connected to the overall university mission and the overall uh, vision of you know uh, creating more informed and empowered learners so that of course takes a little bit of time for students to understand that you know where we are going with this and how this degree is just not it's just more than a degree it's just a, you know our commitment for the student for their continued education and continued learning process uh, then of course institution related so institutions individually uh, also have to take that uh, you know ownership and they should have uh, employed a very a uh, comprehensive assessment systems where they look at what faculty is design, designing as part of their curriculum and then see that if there is uh, relevance uh, in the curriculum that is being designed uh, by the faculty at liberal arts institutions and the spirit and philosophy of liberal arts education uh, that an, an individual institute promotes uh, so another very important factor and this was a question which is the most asked question at this workshop that i was taking in uh, when we were being asked to look at into our own curriculum uh, there was also a very important question that you know in in addition to the curriculum and lessons and you know in class content that we are offering to our students it's very important for us to as an institution to address that what are some of the practices and what are some of uh, the initiatives that we have on on campus or in our university that are supporting that liberal arts spirit uh, so this also sort of you know uh, 
brings uh, this discussion out and open that you know it's the curriculum the liberal arts education does not only restrict itself to a particular curriculum or in class learning so we also have to think about that how as a university we are supporting liberal arts education by taking the initiatives not just in class but outside class so again and then we need to have a proper comprehensive system of assessment in place where we are putting these two together that you know how our in class learning and outside class learning is actually uh, translating into liberal arts education and its goals being met <coughs> uh, then of course uh, society related um, when we were talking about in this workshop we were talking about different models that we have in liberal arts education and uh, when you look at it from a societal or maybe from a country's perspective, I think this is something which is very common. This I think this cha challenge, including ourselves, has had been identified by everybody at that point in time. Uh, is the ownership of the country related to, and especially the government and governance related to the liberal arts education? So, for example, uh, from India, are uh, the colleagues who were at the at this workshop, and they shared that you know when you talk about in India. Our biggest problem is that, you know, we do not have enough universities for our tertiary enrollment. So, like, if you if you look at the kind of population of uh, students that we expect to enroll in universities, we probably need 1,000 more universities. And, again, the priority of the liberal arts education then, of course, is further moved down when you are looking at, you know, what do you have and then what do you need. Uh, so, again, they were very... Uh, clear about the need assessment that they had that you know they don't even have enough institutions for tertiary education and in India if uh, they also mentioned I think we also know from our experience that it's a very exam driven uh, very again competitive exams uh, that are happening at a state or a, or, an, uh, or a country level and then it's very exam driven so that when you when students are preparing for that exams they are almost set for the career path that they are going to take later on uh, so in between the liberal arts education and how it fits into that system is very difficult uh, there are uh, private uh, ventures when it comes to uh, setting up institutions liberal arts institutions in india but the state yet to have yet to take the ownership of liberal arts education uh, so that's one uh, so again, there was there were some reflections from uh, again uh, Japan as well, where liberal arts education, and especially uh, the issue was related to bilingualism. Uh, so when they were trying to sort of teach their students in different languages, so that is something that you know they were trying to figure out as a model of that if this could lead to student success as well. Uh, then some of uh, these institutions uh, also kept uh, you know connection of students across different countries. So they had included a component where they are supposed to go to, in, to a different company, uh, country to get that exposure. So we spoke about challenges and we also spoke about different, uh, you know, practices as well. But I think our challenges were very, very uh, similar. And then some also South Asian institutions uh, pointed out that, you know, there is so much of excessive bureaucracy that they, if they, if they have to get, uh, you know, approvals or minor changes to their curriculum, they have to go through like, you know, months and months of approval. And that also sort of affects on how they want to evolve as a liberal arts institution. Uh, so, of course, there is a, as far as academicians are concerned, educationists are concerned. So they are up for it. They want to do it. Uh, but of course, there are like state level or government level or governance related challenges when it comes to uh, uh, their liberal arts education and adopting that kind of curriculum. <coughs> uh, then global context related challenges. Um, there was, uh, I remember this, there was this graph that was being shared at the workshop, which was very fascinating. And it was a study which actually came out of, uh, it was a, it was some findings that came out of the book of uh, F.M. Reimers, who's very, uh, you know, actively uh, working on uh, curriculum related to global citizenship. Uh, so they did a survey and in that survey, they asked a question that, do you feel yourself that you are a global citizen? So they were, they actually conducted that study across different countries. And it is very important for us to look at how individual and how students feel that if they are they are not part of that global global citizenship, and uh, especially when it comes to when you look at the findings in the South Asian countries, are in, uh, students at an individual level feel that you know they do not think as themselves as global citizens. So if you look at the percentages, they they drop down when we talk about South Asian countries because our students maybe there there is some percentage, but I think in Pakistan it was about 27, 28 who felt that. They may they feel that they are global citizens, but majority of them 
do not think that they are part of global citizenship they think they their understanding about that was very different uh, so again uh, it it also sort of it's very important that because we are talking about students so it's very important and that particular information is very important for us to do self reflection that no matter how effective the curriculum is if students are not on board with us uh, especially when it comes to liberal arts education then of course it will not lead to success uh, then market related challenges uh so with my experience in advising center and uh, we usually uh, our interaction of course goes beyond uh, their four year degree and when they come back to us and when they talk about how they are doing in the uh, doing well in the market uh, so sometimes we do get that feedback uh, from our students that you know the students who have come from different universities with four years of specialized curriculum so sometimes it's just not that they are not capable but the employer's perception towards their liberal arts degree is different from what uh, it's in comparison to the students who have come from a four year professional degree so they do talk about professional perception as well and this perce uh, professional perception is also very relevant to the indian market uh, so there are very, very few uh, liberal arts institutions in uh, india but they also talk about that it's like it's a whole they need to do more lobby they need to sort of you know bring it uh, very clearly and they have to ha have support from different uh, you know associations uh, and there's a lot of pr involved in order for them to be accepted uh, you know against a student who's actually coming from a very uh, professional school with a training of 4 to 5 years uh, so that's of course is a market related challenge so employers uh, yet have to understand that you know uh, again the comparison between a professional and a citizen so what is better for the society so i think the market still needs to have that understanding and employers especially uh, still need to have that understanding mm -hmm. uh the second part of this talk is about this 13 step protocol uh, i and dr usana were actually talking about before this workshop uh so we were thinking that you know it's a very interesting 13 step, step protocol and so whole book it's available online <clears throat> i think it's, it's the summary or commentary is available online but you can always check it's a very interesting guide sort of a guide where it tells you that how to think about liberal arts education curriculum uh, and this 13 step protocol actually had global citizenship curriculum where the the professor it, with with the graduate students they designed the curriculum over the grades so from grade 1 to grade 12 so they thought that if they have to meet a goal of global citizenship so these are the goals and these are the lessons that are need to be included at every level so that talks about the comprehensiveness of uh, liberal arts education and how to sort of think about it uh, what i really like about this 13 step protocol where it sort of differentiates between the lessons and the curriculum uh, so again in this uh, book in this guide the the professor also speak about the idea that you know we can't really say that if we are delivering the lessons we are also justifying the curriculum goals that we have so that is the differentiation that he makes and this 13 step protocol has the same understanding and has the same kind of spirit that it actually makes us question and makes us uh, understand that you know how everything is connected so how we like are we taking or do we have liberal arts goals uh, do we have this philosophy of liberal arts and are we drawing our curriculums our lessons our assessments in uh, in connection to those broader liberal arts goals that we have uh so this is again a very interesting exercise and i hope this you know this converts into a workshop and we get to do more hands on training uh but i think for faculty and especially for the new faculty uh i think to begin with it's a great protocol to look at because it really asks very relevant questions when it comes to our own curriculum designing practices uh, at university level and thinking about the courses that we are thinking uh, we are designing and then also thinking that how aligned we are in terms of liberal arts education uh so that's uh, uh that's one so there are like 13 steps and each step has very clearly defined sub roles and sub goals that we need to look at so beginning with uh establish a leadership team uh so it's very very important uh, especially when you are following this protocol because this protocol will eventually lead you to sort of have uh, a liberal arts curriculum or a to help you to meet the liberal arts uh, curriculum goals so the leadership is very important uh, so this is something that we also have seen when we were talking about uh, the different levels of challenges 
so when when we were in workshop we were also talking about that you know it's very very sometimes it's very hard to get that ownership to get that leadership from that institution uh, and that without this leadership team which is you know sort of understanding that we have to uh, prepare a prototype we have to assess it then we have to take back the learnings and we need to sort of reassess our cur curriculum reapply then learn so it's a very continuous process and for that continuous process needs uh, a very dedicated team who takes that task so ideally speaking there should be like liberal arts or this protocol experts uh, in different institution who can help the faculty uh, develop the prototypes help them test it with their students uh, take the feedback and see where uh, the gaps are where the loopholes are and then develop a long term vision uh, it's very important i mean uh, even if you look at our own uh, example as an institute we have courses so we have courses for in every disciplines uh, but we still have to sort of sit down and develop separate goals for those particular general education courses and how they are leading it so it's very important that we have a vision in place uh, and that lead team can also sort of help you to have to put together a vision where you are sort of you know you are working towards uh, then framework that includes knowledge skills and dispositions uh, so that step 3 um, especially in this protocols example uh, where uh, rimas has actually used the curriculum of global citizenship so he has right that's what it basically it helps you to know so for example for global citizenship he has a framework and competencies that are drawn from uh, millennial goals then uh, sustainable development goals and world economic forums challenges and risks that are identified for the world so these frameworks are really important because these frameworks will help us to sort of get to those competencies that we would like our curriculums to uh, spell out audit the under uh, existing undergrad curriculum so it was a very interesting point because this was this was this was actually the highlight of the exercise and workshop that we were doing <clears throat> the protocol does not say that you have to uh, completely throw out everything that you have and have everything new in the place that's not really the purpose the purpose was that we audit our cur curriculum and see how aligned we are and if we are not aligned we are slowly and gradually moving towards aligning our you know liberal arts goals and then the existing curriculum that we have uh, so that is the major challenge uh, because i think that's that's what we were also facing that you know we have all of the universities have already de developed curriculums and then sort of making changes into it and then ne needing ownership and needing approvals and needing uh, you know people's consensus over that was the toughest toughest task uh, which was also the case in the other countries as well so slowly and gradually when these institutes where they were setting up their liberal arts programs so that's where the problem was that the existing curriculum is to be aligned with the liberal arts spirit and that's where the challenge is then design a prototype so prototype uh, especially which is then drawn from the competencies that are there and for each liberal arts program those competencies will then give uh, birth to a particular prototype that is existing uh so this specific uh, book that i'm talking about uh so when they were talking about global citizenship so they have broken down global citizenship goals over 12 different standards and for each standard they have a very specialized design lessons and each lesson has their goals and each lesson has its assessment strategies but at any point in time uh, they were not disconnected so again so something that is done at the grade level will feed to uh, whatever outcomes are and whatever learning has happened at the grade 1 will feed to the learning of the grade 2 so it was very interconnected at the same time but yet it was you know exclusive in a way that there is no overlapping so the prototype itself basically facilitates uh, a framework where uh, i mean if you talk about fc i think in in our university what we can do it uh, do is that if we have decided on on our liberal arts goals uh, that this is something that we would like to do we want to promote the appreciation of athletic uh, aesthetics and arts mm -hmm. so we see that how different courses uh, how this particular vision or how this particular goal could be subdivided over different objectives and how each of the course is sort of you know taking a lead in terms of feeding into that particular objective so what was interesting was that uh, the prototype did not encourage to have one course for a goal because the goal itself has to be reflected into different courses that students are taking 
so the objective was never never to sort of have one course and then course is sort of you know helping you to meet that objective the spirit of the liberal arts education is that you have a goal in place and see how that particular goal is being reflected in different courses so if we have for example global citizenship if we have appreciation of cultures and histories so appreciation of culture and history how it is reflected through different courses instead of have, having one course that is appreciating culture and history mm -hmm. so that is a very interesting approach that it's not confined to a particular course uh, it's actually it's very goal driven mm -hmm. so it's it's not even confined to certain number of lessons it's not confined to a certain you know course that you need to take or certain hours you need to do uh, but it it takes a maybe a broader uh, scheme of things and for us to look at that how different courses could reflect different kinds of competencies uh, that are there as part of our liberal arts vision uh then of course uh, communicate vision framework and prototype <clears throat> so before the prototype is launched uh, this is what is believed that there has to be very extensive communication about the prototype uh, and i think though two points uh, uh, in this entire prototype uh, where uh, the curriculum were, was being audited and second was where uh, the prototype is being communicated these are the most sensitive points because when you talk about auditing these existing curriculum so of course that's like that's as as a faculty or maybe as teachers it really puts us out of our comfort zone because we have a routine of doing things mm -hmm. so when you audit the curriculum that's was the that was a consensus at the workshop as well that it really sort of you know creates a uh, you know a discomfort for us to sort of look at the practices that we are doing and then changing it according to the spirit so that's one area of challenge uh, the second area of challenge of course is of course this communication of the prototype the vision so everybody has to be on board <coughs> so for example in university uh, your student body your faculty uh, your staff uh everybody needs to understand that you know this prototype is going to help us achieve a broader uh, vision so that communication is very important so that was also one of the things uh, that was being identified at the workshop that the people who are working on the prototypes uh, sometimes fail to make understand the broader university or broader community that how it is leading us to meet our vision so in uh, so in addition to a staff member who is required to provide technology support or academic support to fulfill uh, a particular class needs he also needs to understand that it is actually connecting to a broader goal that we are talking about so that is something that that was the point of focus that it's very important to effectively communicate that what we are doing our practices are not existing in isolation they are not individual practices but they are interconnected and everybody is on board with it uh, so before even the prototype is launched it's important that you take especially the student body and your faculty and your staff on board uh, in order to help that how it is going to help us understand or meet the overall vision uh, then of course decide on revised prototype to be implemented uh, then once the prototype is communicated and then there is no perfect prototype that is the spirit of this 13 step protocol that you can't really say that you you are this is the final prototype and this will be used forever uh, that is the thought that we need to refrain from that that no thing is the final thing it will improve on based on the student feedback based on of course the assessments that we are doing uh, so openness both from the student staff and faculty and other other members of the community to accept uh, the changes Uh, to be open to the changes be open to the criticism if the prototypes don't work uh, so again a prototype will not be a final thing it will be tested retested and it has to feed uh, back to uh, your original vision so if there are dif differences and deficiencies then they need to uh, necessary adjustments are made uh, uh, then identify the sources necessary and available to implement resources uh, again that was also a common south asian challenge that dedication of resources for liberal arts education institution is a problem uh, it's a problem at community level it's a problem at the level of governance that sometimes you know your uh, associations commissions that you are they are which are part of that you know uh, education market uh, are not on board with us and of course there are allocation of resources and allocation of necessary uh and resources that, that are required to do that prototype and to implement that prototype uh 
then of course uh, framework to monitor implementation so again dedicated framework for the implementation and assessment uh, so again step number 9 uh, is basically looking at the work that has been done uh, up till now and then rigorously monitoring its implementation rigorously monitoring the prototype auditing it uh, finding out the deficiencies in it and then developing communication strategy to build and maintain the support uh, so it's a very continuous effort over the period of time and again if you look at uh, step number quickly if we look at step number 8 9 and 10 uh, they really talk about a continuous support from allocation of sources uh, then a team and trained experts who can monitor uh, its implementation that to what level it is being implemented individually in classes and at the same time how it is being implemented outside the classes so framework also has to be in place for the prototype to be uh, evaluated uh, then strategies and of course strategies to maintain support uh, at any point in time it's, it's a consistent effort uh, sometimes when the initiatives are taken, uh, that is the time that everybody is most enthusiastic about. Mm -hmm. uh, but the protocol really will work only if it sustains the test of time. So if your enthusiasm drops, if your uh, if the faculty withdraws their, if there is a drop in the student motivation, so all of these are like challenges that will be there, uh, especially when we are monitoring and we are. Uh, so that, of course, is a problem. It's a challenge itself. And it's 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 something that, again, takes place over the period of time. And that continuous support and continuing monitoring and evaluation uh, is very, very important. Uh, then develop a professional strategy and uh, execute the prototype with oversight and support of the leadership team. So the initial leadership team that has taken uh, the ownership of the prototype and implementing it and uh, monitoring it and making sure that it is that we are learning from it. And and we are executing it and we are using it for our students in the correct way. Uh, so then they have to uh, make sure that this prototype is successfully executed in the classes. So of course, in every class, uh, every curriculum reflects that, every class practice reflects that. So again, from the most macro issues, uh, from developing a team and taking the institution on, on board, uh, to the most micro issues where uh, you know the content is being delivered to the student and they have understood uh, the value and everything so i think that connection needs to be uh, drawn very very clearly um then last but not the least is the last step is to evaluate the execution of the prototype adjust necessary and repeat so again as this has been discussed before that it's a continuous process at any point in time uh, we do not leave the gap of communication in between. So from the minute the leadership has been taken and then they have started to work on that prototype, the uh, prototype, the curriculum is being designed until the point that it is being evaluated and adjusted. It's a continuous effort. And then, of course, you, you tend to repeat it. Every time you learn that some things did not work out with the prototype, you go back and change it. So by looking at it, though it, it looks great, but it's a very, very long-term commitment. Uh, and again, if the liberal arts education uh, programs and you know really want to uh, sort of live and breathe the spirit of liberal arts education, uh, if not this exactly, but something similar to this has to happen. Uh, where there is a vision and goals that, uh, is very important, uh, and that's exactly and uh, this. Uh, literature that I'm referring to, it does not only talk about the success, it talks about a number of failures at a number of different levels. Mm -hmm. So it does not say that there was a prototype that was being established about global citizenship and suddenly everybody was global citizen. Mm -hmm. It did not say that. It said that, you know, there was, and especially it talks about, uh, you know, every time in this prototype, they when they were mentioning the challenge, so they say that every time uh, the prototype was to be executed, uh, suddenly the faculty who were working on the pro prototype could not deliver it as part of their practice. Uh, and some were not motivated enough to sort of change their cur curriculum or to include some, uh, you know, things that are different from what they used to do. So again, it does not only set, like talk about uh, the goods, but also the challenges that, that are going to be there. So I think it's true for every institution that, you know, every time they are 
looking at something like that, which is so comprehensive, it's a long, long term commitment. Uh, I think those kinds of challenges are uh, inevitable. Uh, so this is pretty much it. Uh, if there are any questions, I would I would be very happy to take them now. Have you done any application of this PDF sheet? Right here. So Dr. Ghazala is asking that if there is an application of the prototype uh, to the university, and that's exactly what I and Dr. Oksana were talking about, that we have to take it up and we have to develop a team uh, which can test this prototype. And before that, we need to have our liberal arts schools uh, in place and we have to have a liberal arts uh, mission. And now that we are working on the accreditation, I think everything... Uh, you know, because everything has come together in terms of very, have a very clear uh, understanding of mission, mission goals, and at the same time, a definition of student success. I think now it is the high time for us to test our protocols and prototypes for the liberal arts education. So there is no exercise as yet. We, I, I individually did it after the workshop just to see that how my individual courses are aligned, mm -hmm. but university-wide, it still we have to sort of uh, come together and do it. Can you show us what you did? I can definitely show. I don't have it. I do have it in my laptop, but I can always uh, share it as, uh, as my prototype mm -hmm. because that's what they made us do, uh, to sort of look at the curriculum and see that how we are doing in terms of arts education. So when this workshop, this hands-on workshop, uh, hope it happens soon. So whenever this workshops, I would definitely like to begin with our, uh, with our own uh, work that we did in the workshop and post-workshop. Uh, so, of course, we, we can share that. Uh, I want to ask, are the students just a beneficiary of the system or would they at any step uh, be, you know, contributing uh, to the prototype that we develop? At what point do we involve students? Because you're mentioning everyone's motivation is important and involvement is important. So, at what point do we involve the students? Uh, I think it's <clears throat> it's an excellent question. and uh, This prototype that that really talks about the global citizenship because that's the example that they've taken and they've developed the curriculum after it. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually started with the survey. So they have taken the inputs uh, from the student in terms of understanding that, you know, if we are developing a curriculum for the students to be global citizenship, how much they are on board in terms of understanding that they want to be a global citizen. Mm -hmm. So they were like, in this survey uh, that is being made part of this study. So they actually started with this question that do you feel that you are a global citizen or do you think that you want to become a global citizen? How relevant the entire conversation is going to be for you uh, in your future. So I think at any point in time, the student, I think that's the best thing about the liberal arts education that we make our students shine. Mm -hmm. So if they are not part of the process, then I think the process is completely uh, incomplete. So anytime we are looking at... A, our goals, we are looking at the adjustments and auditing that we need to do in our own curriculum. We have to take our student needs and feedback in consideration uh, because I think without that, we can't really see that we are heading in the right direction. So maybe it's uh, an initial need assessment while we are putting a prototype together uh, and their expectations. But uh, of course, I would say that this prototype at any point in time did not say that the student should not be part of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, one more thing, uh, actually, uh, tell that there is a society-related society issues. So about the job uh, mm -hmm. they are creating, and uh, how we can overcome that thing um, when uh, the student goes toward the market <laughs> the job. So how we can overcome that, uh, that thing? Should not we uh, introduce some workshops or at the government level so we can overcome this? Uh, <laughs> I think... Uh especially when it comes to the perception of the employer, this was being discussed at the workshop also that, you know, some, and this is sometimes beyond the universities to sort of control a particular employer's perception about uh, a degree and sort of compare it to a student or a graduate who has a different kind of system. But I think uh, it's very important and uh, especially when we talk about acceptance of liberal arts education, it's very important that we form uh, alliances and we form lobby in terms of you know, projecting that what we are doing is is fully compatible or maybe better in some in some ways. So when we were uh, we at this workshop, we had some of the colleagues from the Habib University, and that's what we we we've spoken about. That you know, 
and i didn't know that liberal arts education what it looks like in habib university habib didn't know what is happening at forman and we've been doing it for so long yes. we've been doing it since 2005 and they did not have a clue about it so i think that is something that we need to do that universities that are that are offering liberal arts education the effort needs to start from them those alliances and then creating maybe necessary pressure uh, or at least projecting in the market that our graduates are equally compatible and then you know so that that pr needs to take place and that has to begin with the alliances within the universities and there were excellent things that are happening in for example christian university in japan and independent christian university a very interesting program was also taking place somewhere in the public university tokyo so again there are of course individual universities doing their effort but still these countries have the similar problem that they are not together like in their in they are not together in terms of so again when we were talking about um, these professional schools so they have uh, state level tests they have mm -hmm. state level exercises placements and this and that mm -hmm. so i think the liberal arts education uh, okay. universities and programs have yet to come to that point where they are <laughs> you know where they are together in terms of what expectations are set out in the market so yeah. Yeah, one thing uh, that uh, we should monitor out of the class uh, how we can monitor the things out of the class kept um, by uh, and something else we can uh of course i think uh to answer your question um when we talk about let me just remove this so when we talk about uh liberal arts education uh out of university uh, sorry out of class experience is very important so that also uh, comes from an event a student has attended or a seminar a student has attended so again if sometimes if we do not have a direct assessment and that's a problem i think when we were uh, when we were looking at the self study and accreditation uh, related to nechi and they asked us about our co curricular goal that these you know events and society events that the students attend where we would like our students to go with this and what kind of objectives they are achieving so i think the sesli they are talking about out of class experience and out of class learning uh and then you know finding out ways to assess it so if you ask me we don't have ways yet mm -hmm. uh, but i think we are thinking in the direction of you know bringing assessments or some way of assessment where we could uh, sort of bring this uh, also as part of our uh, understanding and uh, i think for the liberal arts uh, we need more resources uh, as compared to when we talk about the yes of four years a specific uh, subject or this so being an underdeveloped country it is not difficult to uh, introduce or to uh, take it beyond that level just there are only three universities that have introduced so we have not that much resources so we how we can address that i i think resources is a common uh, challenge i think uh, if we if you put us i mean we if you put us in comparison to the other south asian countries they are doing comparatively better in terms of resources we still have to like go to the point where they are actually mm -hmm. but it's a major major south issue asian. for south asian uh, universities when it comes to resource and it is it is directly mm -hmm. it is directly actually coming mm -hmm. from, somebody's yeah she is new now i think it was Kumar. she basically so coming... wanted to ask a question so that's why i unmuted her oh okay so i'll just finish this one and we'll go to that is that okay yes ma'am please yeah so resource again uh, if you ask me i don't know honestly uh, about how do we get to these resources but we need resources and the problem is that uh, resources allocating to liberal arts education is not the priority and this is the case with most south asian and that's where those alliances are important because you put the necessary pressure for allocation of resources so maybe uh, maybe that uh, there was another question gohar sorry yes ma'am ms tazeen bukhari from the english yeah, department sure, ms tazeen over to you uh, uh, thank thank you gohar can you hear me yes yes loud and clear yeah okay uh, thank you ms anam it was uh, it is nice to be here and it was quite informative uh, for newcomers like myself uh, i'm just wondering that how do we match like you know there is a lot of uh, you have stated quite obviously regarding global citizenship i mean those are the goals that we are trying to achieve through our students and through the designing of the curriculum 
and of course the, regarding the sustainable goals it depends for my understanding it depends uh, it is quite con- a contextualized uh, uh, a contextualized uh, concept to have sustainable goals because we cannot ignore our uh, you know our existence in south in in asia or in southeast asia so my question is that how do we match you know the quality assurance if there is is no perfect prototype as you stated like there is no no perfect uh, prototype as such so how are we going to uh, you know match the uh, a quality or deliver quality um, how would it be done or is it too far fetched an idea right uh, tadeen thank you for your question uh, when we talk about excuse me <laughs> so when we talk about prototype uh, it does say that i mean uh, the idea of uh, perfect prototype might not exist but an acceptable prototype where it is uh, fulfilling most of your curriculum requirements uh, in spirit of liberal arts education uh, can be worked out so uh, especially when you look at uh, the details of these 13 step prototype it's just that you know you sometimes when you have developed a prototype uh, and you are sort of practicing it and you are exercising it into the classes the idea was that just don't be too happy with it until unless you audit it uh, you see the practice and you see how practically it is working for your students and then learn from it and come back and do changes to it so uh, when i was saying that there can't be a perfect prototype what i meant was or maybe this guide means is that you know don't be just like too satisfied with one prototype that it sort of uh restrains you from doing the necessary auditing and looking into the mistakes and deficiencies that are there and coming back and correcting them uh, it does talk about an acceptable prototype that is developed over the period of time and has you know fulfilled most of uh, the liberal arts goals uh, but that will not happen until unless we test it and over test it uh, so yes there could be an acceptable prototype fulfilling major requirements but there can't be like one proto- perfect prototype and the perfect prototype that sort of restrains you and refrains you from auditing it and changing it that is something that should not happen so there could be a good prototype uh, but again it should be again open to auditing and changing it according to the deficiencies that uh, being identified so, so, so yeah time. so so you mean it is going to be more flexible yeah Because, open to uh, changes uh, open okay, to changes open if to changes. deficiencies and gaps are identified mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any more questions? No, ma'am. I don't see anything in the comment box. We will. We have a few comments. Uh, thank you for such an informative session. Miss Abab Iqbal says very informative session. And uh, yeah, I think so. Doctor Shaista says thank you, Doctor Anam. Yes. Okay thank you everyone thank, thank you thank you doctor anam for session